Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit 2017. Brought to you by Databricks. Welcome back to theCUBE, day two at Spark Summit. It's very exciting, I can't wait to talk to this gentleman. Uh, we have the CEO from Databricks, Ali Goetze, joining us. Ali, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Well, we sat here and watched the, the keynote this morning with bated breath, and you delivered some big announcements. Uh, before we get into some of that, I want to ask you, it's been about a year and a half since you transitioned from VP products and engineering into a CEO role. Mm -hmm. What's the most fun part of that, and maybe what's the toughest part? Oh, I see. That's a good question, and that's a tough question, too. Yeah. Uh, most fun part, part is, um, you know, you touch many more facets of the business. So in engineering, it's all the tech, and you're dealing only with engineers, mostly. And the customers are one hop away. There's a product management layer between you and the customers. Mm -hmm. So you're very inwards focused. As a CEO, you're dealing with marketing, finance, sales, mm -hmm. these different functions. And then, externally, with media, mm -hmm. with stakeholders, a lot of customer calls. So you're, uh, you're just, there's many, many more facets of the business that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And it also gives you a purview, and it also gives you a perspective that you couldn't have before. Mm -hmm. you, you see how the pieces fit together, mm -hmm. so you actually can have a better perspective and see a little mm -hmm. bit further out than you could before. Before, I was, I was more in a more myopic mm -hmm. situation where I was seeing sort of just uh, the things relating to engineering. So well, you're that's, obviously, the, that's the best part. You're obviously working close with customers. You introduced a few customers this morning uh, up, up on stage. Uh, but after the keynote, uh, did you hear any reactions from people, what, what are they saying? Yes, yeah, so the keynote was recently, so on my way here, I've had multiple people, sort of, a couple people that high five just before I got up on stage here. <laughs> uh, on the serverless offering, people are really excited about that. Less mm -hmm. DevOps, less, com less configuration, let them focus on the innovation, they want that. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's celebrated. Um, yesterday, Can you recap that, recap that real quickly for our audience here, yeah. what, what the serverless offering is? Absolutely, so uh, it's very simple. We want lots of lots of data scientists to be able to do machine learning without having to worry about the infrastructure underneath it. So we have something called serverless pools, and the serverless pools, you can just have lots of data scientists use it. Under, under, under the hood, this pool of resources shrinks and expands automatically. It adds mm -hmm. storage if needed, um, and uh, you don't have to worry about the configuration of it. And it also makes sure that it's, it's isolating the different data scientists. So one mm -hmm. data scientist happened to run something that takes much more resources. Mm -hmm. It won't affect the other data scientists that are sharing that. So the short story of it is you cut costs significantly. Mm -hmm. You can now have 30, 100 people share the same resources and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it enables them to move faster because they don't have to worry about all the DevOps that they otherwise have to do. Yeah, uh, George, so. is that a really big deal in it's, the industry? Um, well, we know whenever there's infrastructure that gets between a developer, data science, and, and their outcomes, mm -hmm. that's friction. Um, I'd be curious to say, let's put that into a bigger perspective, which mm -hmm. is, if you go back several years, mm -hmm. what were the class of apps that Spark was being used for, and in conjunction with what other technologies, mm -hmm. you know, then bring us forward to today, and then maybe look out three years. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, from the very beginning, uh, Data is key for any of these predictive an analytics that we are doing. So that was always a key thing. Um, but back then we saw more Hadoop data lakes. There were more data lakes, data reservoirs, data marts that people were building out. We saw also a lot of traditional data warehousing. Uh, these days we see more and more things moving to cloud. So the Hadoop data lake, we see it oftentimes in enterprises being transformed into a cloud blob storage. That's cheaper, it's geo-replicated, uh, it's on many continents. So that's something that we've seen uh, happen. Uh, and we work across any of these, frankly. We, from the very beginning, Spark, uh, one of its strengths is it integrates really well wherever your data is. And there's a huge community of developers around it, over a thousand people now that have contributed to it. Many of these people are in other organizations. They're employed by other companies, and their job is to make sure that Databricks or Spark works really, really well with, say, uh, Cassandra or with S3. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a shift that we're seeing. Uh, in terms of applications people are building, it's moving more into production. So four years ago, much more of it was interactive, exploratory. Uh, now we're seeing production use cases. So the fraud analytics use case that I mentioned, mm -hmm. that's running continuously. And the requirements there are different. You can't, 
go down for say 10 minutes mm -hmm. on a Saturday morning at 4 a.m. when yeah. you're doing credit card fraud because that's a lot of fraud and that affects uh, uh, you know the business of say Capital One. Uh, so that's much more uh, crucial for them. So what would be the surrounding um, infrastructure and applications to make that whole solution work? I mean, would you plug into a traditional system of record at the sales order entry kind of um, process point? And um, what other, are, are you working off sort of semi real time or near real time data? Mm -hmm. or, and did you train the models on the data lake? Mm -hmm. how, did, how did the pieces fit together? Yeah, so unfortunately the answer is that it depends on uh, the, the particular architecture that the customer has. Every enterprise is slightly different. Uh, but uh, it's not uncommon that the data is coming in. Uh, they're using, say, Spark structured streaming in Databricks to get it into S3. So that's one piece of the puzzle. Then when it's end up there, from then on, it funnels out to many different use cases. It could be a data warehousing use case where they're just using interactive mm -hmm. SQL on it. Mm -hmm. So that's a traditional interactive use case. But it could be a real-time use case where it's actually taking those uh, data that is processed mm -hmm. and it's detecting anomalies and putting triggers in other systems and then those systems downstream will react to those triggers mm -hmm. for anomalies. Uh, but it could also be that uh, it's periodically training models and storing the models somewhere in some, it could be in, oftentimes it might be in a Cassandra or in a Redis or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. It'll store the model there. And then some web application can then take it from there, do point queries to it and say, okay, I have a particular user that came in here, George now, quickly look up what is his feature vector, mm -hmm. figure out what are the product recommendations we should uh, show to this person, and then mm -hmm. it takes it from there. So, so in those mm -hmm. cases, Cassandra or Redis, they're playing the serving layer mm -hmm. as well, but the, the generating the predi prediction model is, yes. ha is coming from you, Yes. and, and they're, just, they're just doing the inferencing, the mm -hmm. prediction itself. Yeah. Um, so if you look out several years, you know, without asking you the roadmap, which you can feel free to answer, <laughs> um, what sort of, how do you see that scope of apps uh, expanding or the, the share of you know, an existing app like that? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think two interesting trends that I believe in, uh, I'll be foolish enough to make predictions. <laughs> uh, one is that I think data warehousing, as we know it today, uh, will continue to exist. However, it will be transformed and all the data warehousing solutions that you have today will add predictive capabilities or they will disappear. So let me uh, motivate that. If you have a data warehouse with customer data in it, in a fact table, you have all your transactions there, you have all your products there, today you can plug in BI tools, and on top of that, you can see what's my business health today and yesterday. Mm -hmm. But you can't ask it, tell me about tomorrow. Why not? The data is there, why can I not ask it, this customer data, you tell me which of these customers are going to churn, or which one of them should I reach out to, because I can possibly upsell these. Why wouldn't I want to do that? I think everyone will want to do that, and every data warehousing solution in 10 years will have these capabilities. Now, with Spark SQL, you can do that, and the announcement yesterday showed you also how you can bake models, machine learning models, and export them so a SQL analyst can just access them directly that's with no machine learning experience. It's just a simple function, function call, right? And it just works. So that's one prediction I'll make. Okay. Um, the second prediction I'll make is that uh, uh, we're going to see lots of revolutions in different industries beyond the traditional get people to click on ads and understand social behavior, we're going to go beyond that. So for those use cases, it'll be closer to the things I mentioned like Shell and what, what you need to do there is involve these domain experts. The domain experts will come in, the doctors or the machine specialists. So you have to involve them in the loop and they'll be able to transform maybe much less um, um, exotic applications. You know, it's not the su super high-tech Silicon Valley stuff, mm -hmm. but it's nevertheless extremely important to every enterprise, every vertical on the planet. That's, mm -hmm. I think, the exciting part of where predictions will go in the next decade or two. If, if I were to try and pick out the, the most um, man bites dog kind of observation in there, the, the <laughs> you know, supposed to be the unexpected thing. Yes. <laughs> I would say where you said all data warehouses are going to become predictive services. Because what we've been hearing, um, it's, it's yeah. sort of the other side of that coin, which yeah. is all the operational databases uh -huh. will get all the predictive capabilities. Yeah. But you said something very, very different. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess my question is, 
are you seeing the advanced analytics go to the data warehouse because the repository of data is going to be bigger there and so you can either build better models or because it's not burdened with transaction um, SLAs that you can serve up predictions quicker? Well, I'm saying something simple is that data warehousing has been about basic statistics. Yeah. Right, it's been a, a SQL, the, the language that is used is to get descriptive statistics, tables with averages and medians, that's statistics. Uh -huh. Why wouldn't you want to have advanced statistics which now does predictions on it? It just so happens that SQL is not the right interface for that. So it's going to be very natural that people who are already asking statistical questions for the last 30 years from their customer data, these massive throws of data that they have stored, why wouldn't they want to also say, okay, now give me more advanced statistics. I'm not an expert on advanced statistics, mm -hmm. but you, the system, tell me what I should watch out for. Which of these customers should I talk to? Which of the products are in trouble? Which of the products are not? Or which of parts of my business are not doing well now? Predict the future for me. But so. w when you're doing that, though, you're now doing it on data that has a fair amount of latency built into it, because that's how it got into the yes. data warehouse. Yes. Whereas if it's in the operational database, it's Correct. really low latency, typically low yes. latency stuff. Yes. Where, where, do, where and why do you see that distinction? That's great. I do think also that we'll see more and more real-time engines take over. So if you do things in real time, you can do it for a fraction of the cost. So we'll also see those capabilities come in. So you don't have to, so I, your question is, why would you want to once a week batch everything into a central data warehouse? Yeah. I agree with that. It'll be streaming in live. Okay. And then you can on that do predictions, you can do basic analytics. I think basically the lines will blur between all these technologies that we're seeing. Okay. And in some sense, Spark actually was the precursor to all of that. So Spark already was unifying machine learning, SQL, mm -hmm. ETL, real time, and that's, you're going to see that everywhere up here. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so you mentioned Shell as an example, one of your customers. Yep. You also had HP, mm -hmm. uh, Capital One, yep. uh, and, and you developed this uh, you know, unified analytics platform that's yes. solving some of their common problems. Now that you're in the mood to make predictions, <laughs> what do you think are, are going to be the most compelling use cases or industries where you're going to see uh, Databricks going in the future? Uh, that's a hard one. Right now, I think healthcare, there's mm -hmm. a lot of data sets, there's a lot of gene sequencing data, and they want to be able to use machine learning. In fact, I think those industries are trans being transformed slowly from using classical statistics into machine learning. We've actually helped some of these companies do that. We've set up workshops and they've gotten people trained and now they're hiring machine learning experts that are coming in. So that's one, I think, in the healthcare industry, whether it's for direct testing, clinical trials, um, even uh, diagnosis, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. um, I do think industrial IT, so the, these are big companies with lots of lots of equipment. They have tons mm -hmm. of sensor data, mm -hmm. massive data sets, and there's a lot of predictions that they can do on that, that that's coming. So that's a second one I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, financial industry, they've always been about predictions, mm -hmm. so it makes a lot of sense that they continue doing that. Uh, those are the biggest ones for Databricks, mm -hmm. uh, but I think now also as slowly other verticals are moving into the cloud, um, we'll see more of other use cases as well. But those are the biggest ones I see right now. It's hard to say where, where it'll be 10 years from now or 15. Mm -hmm. Things are going so fast that <laughs> yeah. it's hard to even predict six months. You months. believe IoT is going to be a big business driver? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. uh, I, I want to circle back to the where you said that you know we've got different types of databases, but mm -hmm. we're going to unify the capabilities yes. without saying you know it's not like one wins, one loses. Yes, I didn't want to do that prediction. Yeah, <laughs> but what? So describe maybe the characteristics of what a database that complements Spark really well might look like. How, that's, how that's, yeah, that's hard for me to say. Um, the, the capabilities of Spark, I think, are here to stay. Uh, so the ability to be able to uh, ETL variety of data yeah. that doesn't have structure, so structured query language, SQL, is not fit for it, mm -hmm. that is really important, and it's going to become more important since Data is the new oil, as they yeah, said. Yeah. Well, then it's going to be very important to be able to work with all kinds of data and getting that into the systems. And there's more things every day being created, devices, IoT, whatever it is, yeah. that are spewing out this data in different forms and shapes. So being able to work with that variety, that's going to be an important property. So they'll have to do mm -hmm. that. So that's the ETL portion or the ELT portion. Uh, the real-time portion, not having to do this in a batch manner once a week, because mm -hmm. now time is competitive advantage. So if I'm one week behind you, that means you know, I'm going to lose out. So doing that in real time, or near human time, or human real time, 
uh, that's going to be really important. Okay. Uh, so that's going to come as well, I think. And people will demand that, and that's going to be a competitive advantage. Wherever you can add that secret sauce, uh, it's going to add value to the customers. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the predictive uh, stuff, adding the predictive stuff. But I think people will want to continue to do also all the old stuff they've been doing. I don't think that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. those, those bring value to customers. They want to do all those traditional use cases as, as well. Mm -hmm. So what about now where um, customers expect to have some, not clear how much, on-prem you know, of an application platform mm -hmm. like Spark, mm -hmm. um, some in the cloud, that now that you've totally sort of reordered the TCO equation, yeah. but then also at the edge, you know, for IOT type use cases. Um, do you have to slim down Spark to work at the edge? If you have serverless working in the cloud, mm -hmm. does that mean you have to change the management paradigm on-prem? What does that mix look like? How does someone, you know, how does a Fortune 200 company get their arms around that? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. this is a surprising thing, most surprising thing for me in the last year is how many of those Fortune 200s that I was talking to three years ago and they were saying, no way, we're not going into the cloud. <laughs> you don't understand the regulations that we are facing or mm -hmm. the amount of data that we have, or we can do it better, or the security requirements that we have. No one can match that. To now, mm -hmm. those very same companies are saying, absolutely we're going. It's not about if, it's about when. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's hard, now I would be hard pressed to find any enterprise that says, no, we're not going to go, ever. Mm -hmm. um, and some companies we've even seen go from the cloud to on-prem and then now back. <laughs> uh, wow. Because the prices are getting more competitive in the cloud, right? Because now there's three, at least, major players that are competing, and right. they're well-funded companies, right? It's, in some sense, it's, you have ad money and office money and uh, mm -hmm. uh, retail money uh, mm -hmm. being thrown at, this, thrown at this problem. Prices are getting competitive. Uh, it'll, very soon, most IT folks will realize there's no way we can do this faster or better mm -hmm. or more reliable or secure ourselves, so. Well, we've got just a minute to go here before the break, so we're going to kind of wrap it up here, and we've got over 3,000 people here at mm -hmm. Spark Summit. So this is the Spark community. Yeah. I want you to talk to them for a moment. What problems do you want them to work on the most, and what are we going to be talking about a year from now at this table? Okay, that's 30 the seconds. second one is harder, yeah. <laughs> so, I think the Spark community is doing a phenomenal job. I'm not going to tell them what to do. They should continue doing what they are doing already, mm -hmm. which is, integrating Spark in the ecosystem, adding more and more integrations with the greatest technologies that are happening out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so continue the innovation. And uh, we're super happy to have them here. We'll continue mm -hmm. it as well. We'll continue to host this event and uh, look forward to also having a Spark Summit in Europe and also in the East Coast soon. Great, so I'm not going to ask you to make any more predictions. How All right, <laughs> no. Ali, this was great stuff today. Thank you so much yeah. for taking some time and giving us more insight after the keynote this morning. Uh, good thank luck you. at the rest of the show. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. so much. Thanks, Thank Ali. you, George. Thank you. And thank you for watching. That's Ali Godzi, CEO from Databricks. We are Spark Summit 2017 here on theCUBE. Thanks for watching. Stay with us. Oh.